Hello, magical people of the internet. I am Jen and welcome to my vlog, I Never Thought I Would, where we discuss doing things we never thought we would do and the fantastic places that they can lead us to. Today, I have an incredible guest. He is a best-selling author. His books have been translated into over 25 languages and he is about to publish his 14th book. Randy Gage. Hi, Randy. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, great to be on with you. Happy 2021. We had a lot of we had a lot of things last year that we never thought we would do. <laughs> Hopefully this year we'll have more, but in a different direction. Yeah, so you manifested all that because you needed more content for your podcast. So <laughs> You created all that drama in 2020. <laughs> oh yes, it was all me. It was all me. <laughs> but you know, there. I mean, obviously, I, I do think it it would it is a seminal moment in history that people will talk about the pandemic the way they talked about World War II or the epidemic with the Spanish flu or the Great Depression. So there, there is definitely legs to that. Um, but I also think every year, I mean, by December 10th, everywhere you look, every TV network, every podcast, every social media is like, oh, I can't wait to get this year over. What a tough year it's been. So many great people died this year. Well, you know what? That happens every year. There are 10 iconic actors and actresses who die and uh, five great civil rights political leaders. And you know what I mean? So there yeah. is, that's kind of a default uh, meme of, oh, let's get this year behind us. And there's this universal belief at, you know, from December 15th to January, 10th that okay the world is now going to be all peaches and cream and unicorns and then of course life gets in the way and we find out okay no it's not it, it's actually this is what's life about it's the ups and downs and the ins and outs and the yin and yang you've had this phenomenal writing career you write about risk management about business personal development and I'm sure it's taken you all over the place. I'm sure you've had incredible experiences. So that leads to doing things that you never really thought that you would do. So why don't you pick one of those experiences that you've had and talk about it for us today? Maybe an opportunity prevented, presented itself to you or something happened in your life that pushed you on a different path, just doing some things you never thought you would do and where it led you because a lot of times our biggest breakthroughs or successes come from doing things that we never anticipated we would do until the moment presented itself i know you have a lot of authors and aspiring authors who listen and i would say this it's kind of uh interesting how my writing came about because I was a voracious reader as a kid. And that's what saved me, my love, my joy for reading, because um, that turned into a love and a joy for learning and reading. And I was, uh, for people who don't know my story, I was in jail for armed robbery at 15 years old, teenage drug addict, teenage alcoholic, get expelled from high school. So my learning has been self-learning and pretty much through reading. And that's why I say that's what saved me, right? That love of reading. But having that love of reading as a kid, I always thought I'm gonna grow up and write a book. That's my dream, I'm gonna be a writer. And you know, I was reading uh, intrigue, spy thrillers and stuff like that. And so that's what I figured I would write, a book like that. And then, like we were saying, life got in the way. And I was coming from a single mother raising three kids by herself, poor family. And I did what a lot of kids did. I started as a dishwasher and then worked up to cook and manager, trainee and whatever. So I was just kind of stuck in 
the restaurant business. And so I was probably 30 years old and had tried to open a pizza place with a partner of mine and we didn't really have enough money and we were trying to bootstrap it. Mm -hmm. And um, the IRS seized it and auctioned it off for taxes. And so I was $55,000 in debt, no car, no job, no money. Uh, started selling my furniture to eat and thought, okay, well, you know, what do I do from now? And I thought, what if, what if I went back and took some writing courses in college and tried to get in, you know, take the GED and see if I could get in college and I thought, well, but how old am I going to be when I finish that? And then I thought, well, I'm going to be that old anyway. What about if? And so I got a scholarship because I didn't have money for it, but I was able to get a scholarship for a community college here in Miami. Uh, and I thought I'll be, I'll do freelance writing. And I, I'd taken a job. I was back cooking somewhere as a breakfast cook just to pay my bills, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought I could be a writer. And so I was buying Writer Magazine and one other one, I forget the name, but a couple of Writer Magazines every month and learning how you pitch stories and send them to editors and how you should format them and everything. And we have the Miami New Times had started up here, the alternate weekly that is in a lot of cities. And so I I wrote a short story and uh, about Miami and Miami Beach, and I sent it over the transom to them. And the editor was a guy named Jim Mullen, and he wrote me back and said, or called me and said, I like the story. I want to buy it. Uh, I'm not sure I can use it, but I think I want it. And I think it was $150. They were going to pay for that. And so he said, yes, that was the first story I had ever submitted. Right, because everybody has their story. They send in 217 rejection letters, and you know, no, the first story I put in, he said he wanted it. And the funny thing that happened is, he never published it. He never bought it. Um, he kept saying, I, "I like it." It was a really weird story I wrote about the 21st Street Beach, which was kind of a gay beach hangout area where there were a lot of drug dealers. And so I wrote like about a day in the life on 21st Street Beach as people were coming up and making drug deals and everything. This is back in the cocaine cowboy days of Miami. And um, so it didn't really fit the format of New Times really, but he just loved the story and wanted to do something with it. So, but because he told me he was going to buy it, I said, okay, I'm a writer now because mm -hmm. I already sold a story. And then he, he never did buy that story. But when he said that, I started writing another one and then he bought the second one and that one actually got published. And so then I really was officially a writer. And, um, it was only then, you know, I, I started doing training for my business. I was working in direct selling and I thought I need to train my team. So I started doing like training programs and then other people and other companies invited me to what I helped train them. And then everybody says, you know, well, do you have a book? You know, what's your book? I want to buy your book. And I'm like, oh, wow, a speaker, I need a book. So I wrote my first book completely, you know, going into it backwards. Um, and it was about direct selling. So it was a how it was nothing like I thought I would be doing fiction, right? It was a how to mm -hmm. nonfiction book about marketing. Uh, but that's how I got into that. So it was quite unexpected and yet expected because I did believe that I was going to be a writer one day. So yes, you knew you were going to be a writer, but you didn't think it would be the type of writer you ended up as. Well, yes and no, because I'm done all these. So this 14th book, will all, they're all nonfiction. Mm -hmm. But the 15th book or the 16th book <laughs> is going to be fiction. It's wow. either going so to ready. be 
You're ready yeah. to embark on your lifelong dream of being a fiction writer. Is it going to be a mystery? <laughs> well, it's going to be one of those international spy thriller things, or I believe it's going to be a sci-fi trilogy, you know, a massive Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, Matrix type of very cool. So you must have a fascinating imagination. With an imagination like that, what's it been like writing these very um, procedural type of books? Well, to me, I don't really try to write procedural. I learned as a professional speaker the because that's really you know that really took off for me, right? I've spoken in more than 50 countries now to more than 2 million people. I'm in the Speaker Hall of Fame, you know, I've done a lot in that. Can you tell us a little more about your speaking career? Uh, well, again, so as an accident, never planned it, but you know, fell into it and then uh, realized, okay, this is a craft just like writing, and I need to perfect my craft. Mm -hmm. And then, so I learned, okay, if I just go there and I speak for two hours about, okay, here's all the things you need to do. Step one, step two, step three, you know, everybody's going to take 27 pages of notes. Oh, that was amazing. They're going to give me a standing ovation. And then they're never going to do anything because who can remember the 27 pages of notes. And as I worked on my craft, I realized, well, I have to, you know, I learned from Bill Gove, who was a mentor of mine. He said, you know, you tell a story and you make a point. And because they remember the story, they remember the point. So even when I, when I started to write books, I took that formula to it. So when I outline my table of contents and I say, okay, here's the, the 10 chapters, the, the content I want to do. The first thing I do is say, okay, what is the story I tell in this chapter that makes the point of this chapter? Mm -hmm. So in that way, I'm not really writing procedurals. I'm just communicating one-on-one -on -one with those readers. That's so fascinating. And it's so clever because it's true. We remember things that we have an emotional connection to. So if there's a story that triggers an emotional connection, then we're going to remember um, whether it's the point of the story or the lesson of the story. So that that's amazing that you were able to connect those dots and start doing that with your books. Yeah, because you realize communication is communication. It, I do the same thing in my blogs, right? Because I can, you know, we can all write a blog, you know, the seven things you need to know to buy real estate with no money down or the seven steps to uh, baking baked Alaska or the seven steps to losing weight. Well, but how engaging is that? How emotional is that? Are people going to connect with that? Are they going to resonate with that? So if, you know, you could write a blog that says seven steps to losing weight and people read it and like it. But if you open the blog with the story of being 120 pounds overweight and not having the energy to play with your kids and getting squeezed in the middle of an airplane seat in the middle seat and the um, the discrimination and the ridicule and the self-doubt you if you opened your blog with that story and then talked about how to lose weight which one's going to have more impact right yeah of course yeah. So to me, even a, all of business, because I'm an entrepreneur, right? I run my speaking business as a business. I run my publishing as a business, right? Everything I do, I, I want to, if I'm going to do this, I would like it to be profitable and successful. And to me, it always goes back to storytelling. Yeah. I never thought of it from that point of view before. So thank you for sharing. Um, so you have several books published. Would you like to talk about a couple of them? Your favorite ones? <laughs> well, my favorite one is always my next one. And in this case, it's called Radical Rebirth. So it's out now. And I feel like it is the, the culmination of all 
my life's work. All of the work on all of my books have found their way into this 14th one because it's, and I think it's really, really relevant for the people listening to this because it's so much about creative creativity and most importantly, how you recreate yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's called Radical Rebirth. And kind of the tagline would be how to kill off the old you and create the new version, the version you want to become. That's so relevant right now because so many of us have had to pivot um, in this past year with the pandemic, the rugs have been pulled out from under so many people in terms of their businesses not being able to make it, their industry taking a sharp turn in one direction or another. So this is the perfect time. I can't wait to read this book. I need this book. Um, and, and this is really what I was telling the editor uh, in, I was uh, pitching it in March, I think. And I'm like, Dude, at some point, this pandemic is going to end and people have had their whole world rock. This will be a book for the times. This will be a book of the moment, um, which I didn't plan that way, right? I didn't know that you were gonna start this pandemic because you wanted <laughs> content for your podcast. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you did. <laughs> no, I'm not, I don't wanna joke, you know, it's a horrible thing. Um, yeah. But um, it really is just serendipity that I feel this is the time for this book because mm -hmm. because I think it's always a time for that. I think there's millions of people that bought somebody else's story. You know, there yes, eight generations of our family have served the military, and I'm the next generation. You know. Um, there, you're a dentist because your father was a dentist and your grandfather was a dentist and your great grandfather. But did you ever just say, do I really want to be a dentist? Is that my story or is that my dad's story? You know, mm -hmm. um, so this is a book to get people to really question that and be mindful about, uh, you know, I opened the book with, right, what do I tell you? I tell a story, make a point. So mm -hmm. how do I open the book? I opened the book with a story. I'm like 13 or 14 years old. I got my really cool white jeans in the closet. So I put them on to go to school. And I'm walking out toward the door and my mother stops me and she says, you can't wear white after Labor Day. Because <laughs> people in Madison, Wisconsin, that's what they know that you don't wear white after Labor Day. Well, I'm a teenager. Teenagers don't believe anything that any adult says. And we question the premise of everything. And I say, well, who exactly made that law? Is that like, was that in the tablets that Moses brought down? Is that a federal crime? Is that, who makes this stuff up, you know? And my poor flummox mother, she like, didn't know what to say because that's just what everybody says. And mm. it's a mind virus that people keep replicating and you don't wear white after Labor Day. Well, you know, I, I was living with a girl once, she asked me to hand her her purse. She took something out of, she gave it back to me. I set it on the floor. She said, no, 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 no. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. She said, the floor is no place for a purse. So I started laughing and she's like, what are you laughing about? I say, that sounds like your grandmother. Why would you say the floor is no place for a purse? And she starts laughing and she says, oh my God, that's where I heard that. Once I put my grandmother's purse on the floor and she said, the floor is no place for a purse. And I'm like, why is the floor no place for a purse? Because that's how I think, right? I'm crazy. I'm insane. I'm wacko. And I think most writers are, right? That's what gives us our gift is we question premises. We have okay. curiosity. Mm -hmm. And, um, and we so just I, don't I, accept I, things because everybody else does. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, um, I, that's how I open the book that if I would have done what everyone else does, because that's my mother said, 
go to school, get your diploma, high school, and then you can get a job. General Motors had a big factory in Janesville, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and you would be set for life, work in the assembly line. And that's what people aspired to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what my mother wasn't being bad or mean. That's what every mother in the Midwest said. It's, hey, you get, if you get a job at GM, you, you'll be set for life. Cause and you'll have a pension. You'll be able to get, take yeah. care of your family. You'll be able to buy a house. All of it's that a stuff. union That's job. You never, mm -hmm. you know. And then, of course, down the road, GM laid off more people than any company in history, right? Mm -hmm. uh, as the auto market changed. But, you know, when I was growing up, that was the story. Mm -hmm. So I would have gone to fish fries every Friday night at the Elks Lodge or Howard Johnson. I would root for the Green Bay Packers. I would get parkas and go out in the 60 below zero wind chill factor every January. And I thought, I don't, I don't like the taste of fish. I hate ugly uniforms. <laughs> I like palm trees and sunshine and, and tropical stuff and so it's 16 years old. And white old. jeans. <laughs> yeah, and white jeans. So at 16 years old, I put everything I could fit into my dot, my old Plymouth satellite and drove to Miami. I didn't have a job. I didn't know a single person here. I didn't have an apartment. I, you know, I rented a room at a hooker hotel on Biscayne Boulevard for three weeks at uh, uh, $19 a night um, until I could find a, an apartment and get a job and but that was I made my story right mm -hmm. and of course I had uh, bumps and grinds along the way and you know as you would expect but thank god I did thanks god I didn't buy in the story that my family would have had for me so now you're still in Miami and you're a best-selling author with your 14th book Wow, that's beyond impressive. You're a speaker. You've been all around the world speaking. I'm so impressed. And I can't wait to read this new book, The Radical Rebirth. I'm so eager to unleash that book on the world. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's millions of people who would look at the premise of that book and say, why would I read that? You know, I've got a job at the bank. I... I'm done at four o'clock every night. I, Friday, I, you know, I go to, I order Domino's and I got my Netflix account and I can binge watch, you know, whatever, Breaking Bad all weekend. And I don't have to think about my life of quiet desperation until Monday morning again. And those aren't the people for my book, but the people of consciousness, the people who, because I believe if you're not challenging yourself and evolving, then you're living a life of mediocrity. And so the people who have bought into the life of mediocrity, you know, keep your head below the cubicle, don't draw any attention to yourself, get through the 40 years, then you can retire, get social security, they're not gonna get anything out of my book. But the people who really believe that life should be an adventure mm -hmm. or the people realize, you know what? I did buy somebody else's story for my life. I'm not living my life. I'm not living my highest good. I'm not working to, to reach the highest possible version of myself. Those are the people I'm just so eager to get the book in their hands because I know what it can do for them. And now the important stuff, where do we get this book? Where can we find it? Amazon, you guys in the States here, Amazon's going to be your best bet. Great. It's, it's out on Amazon. It's out on Kindle. Uh, I haven't recorded the audio version yet, so that's going to be a little later. Mm -hmm. uh, for people overseas in other places where Amazon isn't shipping, or if you want a personally signed one to somebody, then get that at my website, which would be randygage.com forward slash radical rebirth. And they could order that there. Excellent. And of course, we'll have all the links below to make it easy for everyone to find the books. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story today, Randy. So inspiring. You've 
you've lived several different lives. You've jam packed them all <laughs> into one. And it's really incredible to hear that. So thank you for coming on and sharing with us. Yeah, I love the whole creative vibe of your, your podcast. So uh, um, thanks for having me on. Thank you. And thank you everyone out there in the interweb for tuning in. Um, check out Randy's books. He's got plenty of them. I'll have the links to more than just the new one below. And I'd like to challenge you out there to do something you never thought you would do because it can lead you somewhere you never thought you would end up in some magical place. Please uh, let us know in the comments what it is and where it leads you to. Thanks and have a great day.